would go ahead and be turning to the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians. Galatians 5. We'll be resuming our study in Galatians there, here in uh, just a moment. Now, just a reminder, we mentioned on Wednesday evening at the end of class, but uh, we're quickly coming into Galatians. So the Ephesians material is already out. If you haven't got a copy of that yet, uh, it is located on the back table underneath uh, the picture board. Uh, it'll be laid out just like the Galatians material uh, outline of the book, introduction. Uh, no questions in, in, in the Ephesians material, but it'll have the outlines for all the chapters. It's an introductory uh, information, so you want to pick that up. Uh, we've got just a couple of chapters left here in Galatians, and then we'll be ready to move on to uh, Ephesians. The book of Galatians is about the defense of Paul's apostleship and justification by faith through grace, apart from the deeds of uh, the law. The reason for the first argument is to set up the second argument. As we pointed out, uh, they went after Paul's apostleship because if they could call his apostleship into question, they as an extension could call into question what he was teaching. So Paul begins with the defense of his apostleship, and then he defends the message of the gospel. We've been showing this outline from William Hendrickson. Uh, chapters 1 and 2, the gospel's origination. 3 and 4, gospel's vindication. And 5 and 6, the gospel's application. We've been showing Jensen's as well. Uh, source of the gospel, 1-1 one, one through 2-21. The defense of the gospel, 3-1 through 5-1. An application of the gospel, 5, 2 through 6, 18. And then we're following my outline, the apostleship defended, 1 and 2, the, the gospel defended, 3 and 4, and the application defined, 5 and 6. We're ready for that final section on the application uh, defined. Our, our chapter content, chapter 1, Paul talks about how he's an apostle of God and not man. Uh, the accusation against Paul is, well, he's an apostle from man, not from God. It's through man. Uh, it seems there were two different accusations. He was made one by man, and then it was through a man. Well, maybe he's an apostle of God, but as if it was from some, uh, I guess, apostle school or something. As if he was made one uh, through men or by men, and he answers that in chapter 1. Chapter 2, he then points out he's not inferior. It seems perhaps some are saying, okay, well, maybe you're an apostle, but not at least to the same extent as somebody like Peter. And so chapter 2, he's not an inferior apostle. Uh, the apostles extended the right hand of fellowship uh, to him and that Jerusalem discussion, the events of which take place in Acts 15. And then uh, when when Peter played the part of the hypocrite, Paul was stood in the face. He had the authority to rebuke him and the note he rebuked him with the same gospel message that the Judaizers were calling in the question. Chapter 3 then was justified by faith <coughs> apart from the law. Uh, he dealt with how you're justified by faith and it can't be by the law uh, the one, uh, it's the one who does them shall live by them, verse 12. Uh, it's not by faith uh, under the old law, but we're saved now by faith. We're children of, or there was a promise to Abraham, and the law did not uh, uh, make null or void the promise to Abraham. So now we are sons by faith. Chapter 2 then is the end of chapter 3. He said we're sons by faith, and if we're sons, we are heirs. So chapter 4, uh, you're slaves under the law, but you're sons by faith. The slave didn't, uh, when one is a minor, they're, they're as if the slave is. They don't have the same rights, though they may eventually be master of all. Uh, but now he says we've come to the point that we're no longer slaves, but we're sons. And if we're sons, we are heirs. He didn't give them the exhortation to continue in the service to Christ in 8 through 20. And then he ended in 21 through the end of the chapter with the contrast of the covenants using the allegory uh, talking about Hagar and Sarah, Ishmael and Isaac. Uh, Hagar and Ishmael representing that old. Uh, Hagar is the old, she's the bondwoman. Uh, her son was not an heir. Sarah was the free woman. Her son was an heir. He was a son by promise. Ishmael was a son by flesh. And as we went through and looked at it, the application, we are children by <coughs> promise, not by flesh. Therefore, we are heirs. Well, chapter 5 and chapter 6 then is what I would call the practical section. Not that there's not something practical in the first four chapters, but what I mean by practical section is Paul in some of his writings will deal with here's the issue at hand. Now in light of this, 
Here's how you need to react and how you need to live. Give an illustration of that. Romans, we studied that uh, some time back. Uh, the book of Romans divides into two sections. One through uh, 11 is about justification by faith, just like the middle section of Galatians is here. So he talks about how all needed justification because all had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and that, that justification is available to everyone, though some reject it. Watch to see that in our class this morning as we'll study Romans, or our sermon rather, as we'll study Romans 10 in our sermon uh, here uh, shortly and go through that chapter. And so he points out how, how there were some that rejected that justification that was available to them. Well, now because you're justified and you're justified by faith, beginning in chapter 12, here's how you need to live. So in your relationships to one another, you need to love one another, so on and so forth. So Paul in his writings will have a, a, what I would call an argumentative section. He's answering whatever the main issue is, and then he's got the application section. We'll see the same thing in Ephesians. You know, all spiritual blessings are in Christ, so now you need to walk worthy. And that's what he does in Ephesians. Uh, and so uh, that's what's happening here. So the, the point here is, because the first two things are true, Paul's an apostle, the message that he teaches us from God, not from man, and justification is by faith, here's how you now need to live. And so chapter 5 is about walking by the Spirit and not flesh. There are two main sections to this chapter, both exhortations. The first is the exhortation to walk are the exhortations in light of being set free, rather. The exhortations in light of being set free, 1 to 15. The first of those is an exhortation to stand fast. Look at 1 through 6. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. So in verse 1 he says, Stand fast in the liberty by Christ. Uh, by which Christ has made us free. Now, go back to chapter 4 for a minute. And remember, at the beginning of chapter 4, under the old law, when one was as a minor, they were as a slave. Right? They were in bondage. But now they are a son. Right? Now you are set free. You can be that heir. Now that you've been set free, do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He's saying, listen, you, met, you, you were in bondage. Whether, and we're dealing with a largely Gentile audience. You were in bondage before the law uh, and the things that you were following, or the Jews were in bondage when the old law was in effect. And, and he's saying, now you, you both can be set free. Why, when you're free, would you try to go back into bondage? You're now free, and you're trying to go back to time in bondage. Now, they're going to the old law, which is taken out of the way. Uh, and they're going to the law, which they, the Gentiles, were not under. Um, the issue, main issue being circumcision. But the point is, you were in bondage before the new law. You're free under the new law. And you're trying to go to the old law that the Jews were in bondage under. Why would you go back? You'll be in bondage too. Verse 2 then. And did I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Now, what he's saying here is not that one could not be circumcised, right? We go to Acts chapter 16. What did he do with Timothy? Had him circumcised. It wasn't the act of circumcision that was the problem. It was the, what? The binding of it. The binding of it. So you've got the Judaizers saying, you have to be circumcised. That doesn't profit you anything. If you go and you're circumcised, that profits you uh, nothing. In fact, if you go back, Christ will profit you nothing. Because you're trying to bind where God has not bound. And I think verse 6 even helps explain it further. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. If a Jew says, you know what, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to circumcise my children. And the child says, you know what, I don't want to be circumcised. Guess what? That, 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 that law that had circumcision binding, that's... Gone. Just like the Gentile wasn't circumcised. That law was taken out of the way. Now a lot of the Jews were because they felt they needed to be. 
The Gentiles, here you have the Gentiles who are being told you need to be circumcised. That doesn't matter if they are or they're not. Why? Because it's not binding. That's not under the new law. That was under the old law. The old law is taken away. It's taken out of the That's no longer in effect. He said in verse 3, And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So here's something that, 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 that's taking place. You've got Jews who are saying, listen, you need to be circumcised. And, and so the Gentiles are being circumcised. And Paul's saying, listen, if you're going to go back to the old law, you've got to go all the way back to the old law. Don't say, okay, we need to be circumcised, but we enjoy, we, we like this over here that we have. And no, if you're going to go to the old law, you've got to go keep all of it. Those sacrifices, those feasts, all of those, you've got to go keep that too. You can't just pick and choose. That's true today. There are some who, who like to pick and choose what parts of the Bible uh, they, uh, they want to listen to. Uh, I, I like this part, but then you want to ignore this part over here because it doesn't, it doesn't line up with what I like to believe and what I like to think, so we'll ignore that. Uh, I did a lesson some time back. It was, a, it was meant satirically, but it's sadly somewhat true several years ago that there was a, a, a group that posted a, a thing that said, uh, you know, you're tired of those Bible verses you don't like? Here's the cut and paste Bible. Cut out the ones you like and put them all in here. And and while people don't, I don't think many people actually do that, in, in actually do it, like actually cut it out. And take, there are many people who do that in principle. Who I, I, I like this over here, but I'm going to ignore this over here because I don't. Like this. Uh, even under the new law today, we've got to keep all of it. We can't say, well, you know what? I like what he says over here about, uh, the, you know, uh, what I have to do to be saved, but I disagree with his law on divorce and remarriage. Or I like what he says about this over here, but I'm going to disagree with this over here. We can't do that. We have to keep the whole law. Uh, it would be pointed out in James that if we keep it and stumble in one area, we're still guilty of all. And so Paul tells him, if you're going to go back, you have to go all the way back. Verse 4, then, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. You may want to highlight this verse. You highlight your Bible or underline it or whatever you do. Uh, there are those who, who, who will say that they talk about once saved, always saved. It, it's one of the points of, of Calvinism, though it may not be full-blown Calvinism. Uh, in Calvinism, if you uh, know the, the, the it's tulip, uh, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, uh, and the perseverance or preservation of the saints, and that is that they can't fall away. Um, and so there are some that argue that you can't fall away. Uh, there are a number of passages we can use to, an to answer this. Uh, we'll talk tonight, Lord willing, about context. Uh, and one of the passages we use that we use for a true point, but I think we use out of context, is we say you've got to be faithful to die, Revelation 2.10. Well, what he's saying is you've got to be faithful to the point of being willing to die. So if you want to show somebody you've got to be faithful and you can't fall away, Revelation 5.4, you have become estranged from Christ. Were these once Christians? Are these Christians? Yes. Were did they once have a right relationship with God? Yes. He told them in chapter 3, you are what? Sons of God. Yet now you have become estranged from Christ because what they've done is try to go be justified by that old law. They tried to go be justified by something outside of what's right here in the new law. And because you seek to be justified by that, you've fallen from grace. If they were to die at that moment, guess what? They would be lost. They did have a right relationship, but they had fallen from grace. Verse 5, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by Faith, and then we already touched on verse 6, where in Christ circumcision, who are uncircumcision of anything, but faith working through love. We'll come back to love later on in the text. But it's not just the faith. This tells me something. It's faith working through love. That means there has to be some act. It's not just a, it's not a, it's not a passive faith. I just believe it's an active. Yeah, I have the faith of the active, but I'll pass it. One flip on the other side of the point would be that love. You know, First Corinthians 13 talks about those who give all the goods, but sell all the goods to feed the poor, all the blood be burned. They don't have love, but then what you want to offer them, obviously, the recipient.
that's dead. So you have both those components. The algorithm, the algorithm has to be motivated. In this case, we're looking specific for love. Yeah. You're, you're right, you're right. Uh, you mentioned First Corinthians and point that out about giving the body to burn and all the other things, but have not love, it profits me. Uh, nothing, so you're right. Uh, sometimes people do the right things for the wrong reasons. Uh, a quick illustration of that. Sometimes there are those that obey the gospel and they say later on, you know what, I obeyed the gospel, but I didn't obey it for the right reasons. And maybe that's what I heard, what I felt I needed to do, but I didn't do it because I realized I was lost. And so sometimes we can do the right things, but we can do them for the wrong reasons. Yes. I think about doing this, and it's probably kind of hard to move most people come on. But the parable of the soils that Jesus said there's going to be some that the words will be snatched away. I mean, there's going to be us, which will be seen from the riches, character of this world. But also the persecution that caused the word. I guess I really thought in the past about persecution about the word would make people like atheists or non-believers. But actually, this persecution that caused the word that would cause a lot of them to fall away. And this is my for instance, it would have been two guys and teachers. It wasn't a denial of the God of heaven, that wasn't the point at all. But those people who were trying to stand uh, fast, honestly content for the faith, which would be a new law. That <laughs> persecution there, not necessarily from non believers in the basic sense of believing in God, but they suffered a lot from those that did believe in God, just they wouldn't accept, you know, the teachings of, of Paul that were obviously, you know, they were verified by the miracles and signs and words. So I guess that just kind of comes to my mind as I was thinking about this. You're right. And again, I uh, hope uh, we got a lot of ground tonight. Hopefully, we'll cover in our study of hermeneutics. And one of the Part of its context, part of the cover is setting the background. And one of the things to point out in the background is it's important to know the background because sometimes we're dealing with different errors depending on what it is. This is an early, earlier writing that Paul's dealing with. So your main issue is actually from Jews who still believe in God who are trying to bring people to Judaism. And then when you get to like Peter's writing in 2 Peter, that's about 67. We're actually dealing with... Uh, persecution from Romans. When you get to John's writings, I think they place in the nineties, we're actually dealing with Gnosticism, at least to some extent. So there are uh, different things. So you're right. Sometimes we think about I think some of those some of those more extreme, if you will, all the way they don't believe in God and persecution, but you're right. Sometimes those that still believe in God could persecute the way they did, uh, the Judaizers were, uh, because they didn't agree with what they said and taught about God. Verse seven now. He gives them an exhortation not to be hindered by the Judaizers. You ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still break circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I can wish that those who trouble you... Uh, would even cut themselves off. Uh, so he tells them in verse 7, you were running well, who hindered you? My understanding is that word hindered has to do with a uh, uh, more of a military term is if the military is marching and the road in front was dug up or I guess in our society today would have been blown up in front of them so they couldn't go any further. You were running well and then it's like you let somebody just take the path out from in front of you and decided to go another way. So who, who is it that hindered you? He said the persuasion does not come from him who calls you. This persuasion, this teaching that you're receiving that's hindering you is not coming from God. A little out of love is a whole lot. Here's this little bit of teaching. Maybe it's not a whole lot of Judaizers. Maybe it's just one or two Judaizers coming in. But they've crept in here in the churches of Galatia. And guess what's happening? They're pulling people away. It may have been a little leavened, but guess what? It leavened the whole lump. There are many being carried off in it. He said, I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will have no other mind. If you have troubles, you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. I have confidence that is, you're going to come back to where you need to be. You're going to come back to the truth. And I, brother, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? That is, you suffer, Paul suffered persecution. Why? Because he's against the Jews. Remember, again, as we set the background, when Paul's put to death, when Peter's put to death, all this later on, the persecution at that point is coming from Rome. And, and, and as Mike pointed out, sometimes that's what we think of when we think of the persecution. But the persecution in the book of Acts 
When Acts closes at 62, this book is complete. This is completed before that. It's not one of the prison epistles. It's written before that. Before that time frame, before 64, your main source of persecution was from the Jews. The Jews are persecuting because of what he teaches. If I still preach circumcision, that is, if I'm preaching the message they're preaching, if that's what the truth is and that's what God was taught, then why am I suffering? Because then I would be in agreement with it, but, I, but we're not. I can wish that those who troubled you would even cut themselves off. I wish they'd cut themselves off from you. Uh, it, here's this problem. And, and, and to solve the problem, I wish those Judaizers would cut themselves off from you because if they're not there, guess what? They can't influence you. Same word, by the way, talk about cut them off. Uh, that occurs when Jesus talks about if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Right? Whatever the problem is, it needs to be removed. And so what he's saying is, I wish they would remove themselves from you so they couldn't cause this problem. Verse 13 now. The exhortation to use liberties properly. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbors yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. Are they free? Well, that's what he said in verse 1. Right? Uh, I think the uh, Bible is based on the critical text. English Standard, New American Standard, NIV, CSB. Uh, for freedom, Christ has set us free, verse 1 said in the, in the, in the uh, critical text. Uh, you've been set free, he points out in the uh, majority text. Now you've been set free, you have liberty. Do not use those liberties for things of the flesh. If they do, go back to what he said earlier. If you use your liberties for things of the flesh, look at what he said earlier, look at what he says later, they are going to be, they have fallen from grace. So don't use your liberties for that. Instead, love one another. Uh, the law is summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Don't be biting and devouring one another. Biting and devouring, this, this tells me this, biting and devouring is the opposite of love, right? And he says if they do that, they're going to devour one another. Verse 16 through 26 now. The exhortation to walk in spirit. 16 through 18, the spirit and the flesh are against each other. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So, the spirit, the flesh, they are... They're contrary. Right? They... Uh, they they're, they're, they're not, they don't agree with one another. Uh, remember this. When Jesus uh, comes to the apostles in the garden, the three that he took with him, and he tells them to watch and pray lest to enter into temptation, for the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So part, the spirit part is willing, right? The part that knows to do what's right, but the flesh is weak. That is, sometimes we give in to the fleshly side. What Paul's saying here, they're, they're contrary to one another. Right? They're contrary. So you, you can't be in the Spirit and then go do things of the flesh. They're opposite of one another. He says, uh, for the flesh lies against the Spirit, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. You may wish and desire for things of the flesh. But if you're really walking in the Spirit, you can't do those things. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, the old law. Remember this going back to the previous chapter. He compared the old law in the previous chapters and used the term flesh. Remember with Ishmael? Ishmael, the son of the bondwoman, was a son by flesh. Isaac, the son of the free woman, was a son by promise. So he used uh, uh, he used. Ishmael to represent what they were under the old law, Hagar to represent that law. That was in bondage and they were by flesh. They weren't free. And so uh, what he's saying here is the law is flesh. It's contrary to the spirit. Now what he says in 19 through 21 is do not do the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, 
sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outburst of wrath, selfish ambitions, heresies, envy, or dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you before, just as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we're not going to go this morning through each and every one of these uh, one by one. Most of them we can look right at and we understand what, what's adultery, what's fornication. We understand that. Uh, we, we, we dealt with lewdness uh, last week in, in lesson in First Peter. So we know what a lot of these terms are. Uh, we've dealt with revelries last week as well. Um, but the point is this. Here are all these, this, these sins, and if you engage in these things, you're engaged in things of the flesh. Co that's contrary to the Spirit. Where are we to walk? In the Spirit. So if we do these things, we're going contrary to what we're supposed to be. Is this an exhaustive list of everything that's wrong? No. In fact, how does he conclude the list? And the like. Or, and things like these, some translations say. Paul could have given a really, really, really long list. He didn't have to give a long list of every single sin. You can, you, you know, you can go back and say, okay, well, it's th things like these as well. The point is this. You take this list, or things that are similar to this, things in the flesh. If you do any of those things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, he says. That is their laws. Then he contrasts that with, here's how you live now in, when you're in the Spirit. But the fruit, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, now, let's make an important note here. There's sometimes we say things, and we don't necessarily mean it this way, but this is how we've always referred to it. As for a show of hands, I bet everyone who's had to raise their hands. How many times do we refer to it as the fruits of the Spirit? As most of us at some point have probably called it the fruits of the Spirit. They're not separate. It's not like works of the flesh. You can engage in one and it'd be wrong. It's the fruit of the Spirit we must possess Every single quality. It's singular. It's one fruit that's born when we're in the, the Spirit. All of these are a result of walking in the Spirit. So love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You go to the works of the flesh, there's law against that. How do I know that? Well, first of all, he just said they were wrong. Now, I'm not talking about the old law. Right? We're talking now about under the new law, there's no law. There's no... Prohibition that says you cannot do these things. In fact, we're actually com uh, commanded to do these things. There's no law against these. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 24. Those things in the previous verses, those have been put to death. Those have been put away. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. They're saying we live in the Spirit. You go back again. Look back up to chapter 3 with me. Chapter 3. Are you so foolish, verse 3, having begun in the Spirit? They'd say, well, we're walking in the Spirit, but they're going back to the flesh. He says, if we live in the Spirit, we need to be walking in the Spirit. That's not how they were doing. They were going back and walking in the flesh, but claiming to be living in the Spirit. If you're really living in the Spirit, you're going to be walking in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. So what he says to them here in 22 to 26 is, instead of doing all these things in the flesh that are contrary to the Spirit, if you're in the Spirit, here's how you need to live. You need to bear the fruit of the Spirit. You need to be living, you need to be walking in the Spirit. Not just saying I'm living in the Spirit, but walking in the Spirit. That's what is pleasing to God. So what do you need to do in light of being set free? You need to be walking in the Spirit, not in the flesh. My God, the way my dad used to apply that taught in high school class. This is how he showed us. You get magnets, and you can't force those magnets together. That's the way it should be. Walking in the flesh, and then walking in the spirit. You can't have what you can't force them together. You're right. You're right. Uh, Paul pointed that out in 2 Corinthians 7 as well. Uh, you can't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Lord, we'll pick up the chapter 6 on uh, Wednesday evening.